good afternoon everyone and thanks a lot to the organizer for having me here today uh, so yeah i will uh, um now talk about uh um still about gene editing but as you can see in a, in a different organism <coughs> and for a for a different application uh from what we we had before uh, um uh, this is just a, to give you a quick overview of my presentation. I definitely have more slides than, uh, than what I'm supposed to have, so I'll probably skim through a few of them. Um, but it, uh, in, in general, what I'm going to uh, show you and, and talk about is uh, um, the malaria burden and uh, how we plan to control malaria. Um, and uh, in particular about gene drives, uh, <clears throat> what they are and how we, we, we build them and uh, how we, we plan to use them. Um, so I'll give you some info on the state of the art, but also show you what are the, the some of the challenges um, related to that. Uh, and I'll also briefly show, if we have time, um, some of uh, the proof of principle that we're building uh, um, regarding quantum measures and prophylaxis to uh, uh, CRISPR-Cas gene drives in the mosquitoes. Um, again, regarding uh, the genetic engineering and the lab testing, as well as some modeling of the prediction of what they can do. Um, so, uh, going just to give you a bit, a bit of background on, on the problem. So, uh, malaria, uh, as we probably all know, is still a bit burden, cause there's still a, a, a lot of deaths, uh, more than 400,000 per year, which is incredible. Uh, lots of cases, millions of cases, and uh, it's uh, very sad to hear that it still kills uh, a child every uh, every two minutes. Um, a child under five. So uh, I'll, I'll stop here. I don't need to say more, but what I want to say is that uh, uh, so the, the, the vector that is responsible for the transmission of the malaria parasite is the mosquito. There are uh, thousands of species of mosquitoes, probably uh, quite a few still not uh, identified. Only a few of these species are able to transmit diseases. So there are other diseases, obviously, that are transmitted by mosquitoes other than malaria. And only three of these thousands of species are responsible for more than 95% of malaria. So we don't really need to get rid of all the mosquito species, but we can focus on these three as a start, and that would be already a major achievement. Um, so malaria control methods, uh, as we know, there are drugs, uh, uh, there are vaccines that are uh, uh, looking at controlling the parasite infection. And there are uh, vector control measures uh, like uh, oops, um, insecticide spraying, uh, uh, insecticide spread, uh, treated bed nets, uh, or breeding site controls. Uh, and they did work. I mean, you can see here they've done uh, uh, um, uh, some, they achieved uh, uh, <clears throat> some good results. However, um, we reached a point where despite the huge amount of fundings that are going through uh, malaria control, we are uh, not able to uh, eradicate malaria in, in many of the areas, in particular in the uh, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, <clears throat> African countries. And some of the problems uh, of, of the reasons that that um, uh, um, uh, we have to, to face in, in doing that is the resistance uh, uh, to the uh, insecticides, for example, uh, <coughs> the efficacy of, uh, of, uh, of vaccines that is still very, very low, and as well as uh, 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 funding gaps, political instability, and uh, difficulty in deploying these countermeasures in these areas uh, that um, uh, are very vast and in and, and most cases quite remote. Um, so here comes uh, uh, the genetic control, uh, which comes, as people think, is a new tool, um, but it wasn't really invented yesterday because it was proposed already quite some time ago by some uh, clever people. I'm not going to have time to go through all of them, but uh, I'm just going to show you that the, the major step that happened 
over the last few decades, which is around 2000s, where uh, uh, my professor in the lab at Imperial College was able to transform for the first time the mosquito, the Anopheles gamma mosquitoes. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the gene drive technology was proposed as a genetic tool to control these insects. And uh, recently we were also able to, to demonstrate the uh, uh, proof of principle of, uh, of these tools, um, together with also our other laboratories uh, in, in US. Um, so uh, what are the gene drives uh, systems and how we use them to control uh, mosquitoes? So, uh, First of all, I want to show you the steps. So there in London, we do uh, 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 genetic uh, engineer, uh, engineering of, uh, of the mosquitoes. So we do a lot of cloning, as you've seen before. We do transformation by micro-injecting the, the embryos. And then we do some small testing in, in the small cages that you've seen here that we test whether what these things are, are supposed to do, do, do what, what is written in, in the tin, basically. And if that happens, so if they do work in these small cages, then we transfer them in these uh, uh, larger facilities, which are basically uh, larger contained uh, uh, um, cages, effectively, uh, that mimic more closely what happens in the environment. So we can uh, modulate the humidity, the temperature, the lights, uh, uh, according to the actual data that we get from, from, from the actual environment. So these are data that are coming from Burkina Faso, for example. And these uh, large cages at the moment are in Italy, are in, in Umbria, in, in Terni. And uh, after that, obviously, there is a, a <coughs> A huge amount of steps there involve regulation and approvals before moving uh, uh, these technologies to the field. Um, and uh, we do this as a part of a consortium that's called Targa Malaria. There's a website, so if you want to know more about this, it's uh, is online. And uh, there is a, a lot of uh, uh, written in, in, uh, in, in the regulation uh, uh, and, and also published. Um, so uh, moving now on to the actual deal, the, the technology. So what are these selfish genetic elements? What are these gene drives? So normally, Mendelian inheritance tells us that if you have uh, a transgene, let's say, inserted in mosquitoes or any genetic traits, after mating with a wild-type mosquitoes, that will be inherited by 50% of the, of, of the progeny, and so on. So uh, if you would imagine to release such a genetic element in a population, it will not increase, it would remain stable, and only it, and if it has a minimal fitness cost, if it has a minimal fitness cost to these mosquitoes, it will gradually decrease over time. But when you have a gene drive element in those mosquitoes, you would expect that this element would be inherited by the majority of the, of the progeny, and therefore, if you release such a mosquito in a population, it will rapidly spread and invade this population. So this is the principle, and these are some of the features that are linked to this gene drive element, um, which uh, have to be species specific. So we say that we're targeting mainly three, three species. Um, they have to be self-sustaining. As we said, we want to release only a few mosquitoes, and they do the job for us. They will spread in a population. In that way, they will also be cost effective. We don't need to build huge facilities uh, uh, in, in many areas. And therefore, simple to implement. And the idea that are durable enough that to, to decrease the number of mosquitoes below uh, the threshold that is ne is necessary for, for disease transmission, and therefore help in eradicating malaria. And uh, um, another thing that I must add here is also com uh, complementary to other uh, uh, interventions. So you can use eventually uh, uh, um, these genetic control tools together with the current tools existing like bed nets and so on. Um, so gene drives can be classified in two different types. The first one is aiming to the population suppression. Okay? So when you release these modified insects, uh, they are meant to spread in a population and at the same time, reduce the fertility or the reproduction capacity of this population and crash it. We will see later how we can do this, because it's not easy to understand how we can interfere with the reproduction and crash a population. Uh, but I'll try to explain it uh, in, in a minute. Second approach, which is, is a bit easier to understand, is 
linked to this genetic element that is meant to spread in a population with something that makes this mosquito resistant to the parasites. What well, this is called the population replacement, okay? So they usually link to this genetic element and antiparasite molecules or something like that. There are also some proof of principle of, of this technology out there. Um, so mosquitoes uh, have uh, life cycles, haddles, they need, uh, females need a blood feeding in order to lay eggs. Then they go through this aquatic stage, larva developments, and then they become this uh, uh, weird uh, creatures that are called pupae. And uh, in a couple of days, they will emerge to adults and, and continue the, the life cycles. They have a sex determination pattern, which is very similar to humans. They have an X and Y chromosome. Uh, so XY would be a male with uh, this funny mustache. And the XX is a, is a, a nice lady with this uh, uh, nasty uh, proboscis that they will use to, to suck your blood. And uh, they, it's known the primary signal that determines the, the uh, the maleness, which is called yob, and is linked to the Y chromosome. And that uh, 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 triggers the splicing of this binary switch, which is called double sex. So according to the splicing of this thing, uh, we'll, uh, we'll decide whether this egg will become a female or a male. We don't know the intermediate steps of that. And the other factors we said before, the, the, the genetic traits follows a Mendelian inheritance. So if you put a transgene in heterozygosis, you would expect that there will be inherited by 50% of the population of the generation. And we saw before a generation of transgenic mosquitoes, we make our plasmids, as everyone uh, that does genetic editing here will probably do. And then we co-inject with a, a source of uh, 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 <coughs> an helper plasmid that could be transposase, integrase, or CRISPR-Cas if you want to do an OKIN or, or an OKOUT. We do embryomic injection, and then we screen our, our G0s that look like this. And then we cross the wild type, and then we, if, you, if you've been good enough, you, you hope you get your, your, your transgenic mosquitoes. They will have a marker that allows easy identification uh, and, and all the features that you had in your DNA. Um, so to build your gene drives, one essential component is the endonuclease. Okay, you need a, a good endonuclease, which originally was, we saw this morning, uh, in 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 uh, uh, range by it was um, in the nature of re-engineered endonucleases, which were good but very complicated to take a natural occurring uh, uh, endonuclease that would target whatever sequence is in the yeast and reprogram them to this to target something else in the mosquitoes. So good but very complicated to to reprogram talents. Very good, but for us it was a bit of a problem, all this modularity here. As we, we said before, we need to go through uh, several generations, and we have shown uh, 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 with Rosophila actually, that over a generation you would eventually lose some of these modules. And more recently, uh, we, we had a, a chance to use this CRISPR that was, as we was said before, it's much uh, uh, more flexible and easy to use, and it seems to work very well in the mosquitoes. Um, so uh, we saw before that we, we, we can do population suppression with the gene drives. And this is what we mostly focus on. We don't really do much there in, in our laboratory at Imperial College population uh, replacement, but we focus on population suppression. One way to do it, that is by expressing this endonuclease during meiosis in the males, this endonuclease eventually should be linked to the Y chromosome. At the moment, we have linked in, in autosomes. This endonuclease recognizes and cleaves uh, um, sequences that are specific uh, to the X chromosome. We have targeted the ribosomal DNA sequence, which is present in a few hundred copies, only in the X chromosome in Anopheles gambia. And uh, if we do that in meiosis, we can remove the X-bearing sperm, a fully Y-bearing sperm, and therefore we can uh, um, generate a male bias progeny and at the same time reduce the number of biting females that can transmit malaria. Second approach is what we call omin-based gene drive. We made a lot of progress in here uh, over the last couple of years, where we have uh, a, our endonuclease inserted in a gene that would be responsible for female ter fertility or development. Um, so this, this, this copy would be by, disrupted by your endonuclease, 
which during meiosis is activated because we use a prom uh, germline promoters to, to express the Cas9, cuts the homologous chromosome that doesn't contain the transgene. And by using the homology direct repair mechanism of the cells, the transgene gets copied also in that, in that chromosome. And by doing so, obviously gets inherited by the majority of the progeny. Okay, so I've already described more or less what this uh, is, so the sex distorter. Uh, um, we have demonstrated proof of principle that that is possible in the mosquitoes by using a natural occurring endonuclease, which is called IPP01. We have recent, a uh, couple of years ago, also used CRISPR to do that, reaching 95% of males, fully fertile. Um, and uh, we have shown that in hunting releases of those who are uh, uh, also good uh, to suppress the population and works also in the second species that is we targeting which is arabiensis uh, you'll find more emphasis in, in those publications so now in there the challenge is to transfer this transgene that works very well from the autosome to the y chromosome because if we can do that at the same time of having a male bias of progeny we could also bias the inheritance of our transgene so effectively this which at the moment is not driving, as we saw before, it will also drive because it will uh, increase its frequency in the, in the progenies. So it will make a gene drive. So to do that, we have engineered a Y chromosome of the mosquito in order to introduce this landing site, which is called ITTP, that we can use to insert whatever we want inside by co-injecting our plasmids with a, a 5C31 integrase. Uh, so all good, but uh, it's not easy as it seems because uh, from the Y chromosome, we can express transgene at the early stage of spermatogenesis. Uh, but if we do that for the egg shredding, we're going to kill our stem cells. So we can't do that. And if we try to do it in meiosis, <clears throat> which works very well uh, when we do it from the autosomes, it gets completely shut down when we link the same construct to the Y chromosome because of a mechanism that is naturally occurring in many organisms, including humans, which is called meiotic silencing. And we have proved it recently by doing a, um, a novel transcriptome analysis. Um, so the homing basis in gene drives instead, uh, we did it. So as we said before, uh, this is how it works. You have your hack disrupting your gene, which is responsible for female fertility or, or female reproduction. And then uh, uh, during germline formation, that cuts this target and copy itself in the, in the other chromosome. Uh, this is a cartoon explaining that. And the thing that you need to get here is that, OK, here I have everything fertile. So both my lady and my boy here are completely fertile. So uh, that allows with this homing process to spread your transgene in the population. Okay. But then you reach in a, a point where the majority of these mosquitoes will have a copy each of this disruption and keep homing these things. So that will generate a lot of this progeny. They have both copies of this gene disrupted in the somatic cells, not in the germline. And in this case, the males will still be fertile and still spread your transgene because you want to keep your males fit, whilst the females will start being uh, infertile or uh, um, incapable of re uh, uh, um, uh, reproduction. Um, so another few minutes uh, on... Uh, on what are uh, the challenges of these uh, uh, interventions. We said already fixes and stability are, is one. And specific and fidelity, as we saw today, is a major problem. Uh, but as well as safety and re reversibility. Uh, so um, I want to spend the last minute or so uh, of, of this talk in, in showing you uh, some of the work that we're doing recently uh, um, in the building, in the engineering of countermeasures to this gene drive. So as we saw, I mean, the gene drive is built to be released in small numbers and propagate in a population on its own, right? So, I mean, effectively, it's not meant to be controlled. Uh, but uh, uh, um, obviously, people are a bit worried about this, and, and I mean, I also understand that. And... Uh, and they're asking us, oh, can you do anything as a scientist to, to stop this eventually or uh, anything we can do? So I'll ignore the genetic resistance for now and how we mitigate that. Um, 
So I'll pass uh, to these countermeasures. So the idea is that you have your gene drive here that, as we said before, is meant to do uh, this kind of job or when you want to do population suppression or replacement. And ideally, your countermeasure should be something like similar to the, 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 your gene drive that you built it in there, but that you can release and have this, this would be the blue one that you can release and that would eventually stop your gene drive in taking over your population and crashing it or, or replacing it uh, for the replacement. <laughs> so the, the, the two classes that we're exploring at the moment, one is based on DNA cleavage, so effectively is in, a, in, in, in the design of two gut RNAs. They will be activated only in the presence of the gene drive. So one gut RNA would cleave the gene drive and the second gut RNA will, will cleave its own locus and eventually home this, this, this two gut RNA, so this anti-drive uh, locus. And um, we're also exploring other alternatives that do not involve uh, uh, cas cleavage, uh, DNA cleavage, uh, such as cas uh, uh, protein inhibitors or gut RNA inhibitors. We got some very good res promising results from, from the first one. And uh, here is just a summary, and I'm going to go through the all, 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 all the uh, dots here. But it, this is for the, for the gut RNA base, so the DNA cleavage base, that we have tested against different gene drive lines. And as you can see, in many of those ones, uh, we get a strong reduction of gene drive frequency, which is usually is, is, is right where you see your red bar here. We see that in, with many of these constructs, we can achieve... Uh, um, a, a re very strong reduction of gene drive homing, so that it tells us it can be used uh, uh, as a control tool. And we also got some very good results when we, we express our anti-CAS uh, proteins. These are proteins that are found in bacteriophages. Uh, they are naturally counteracting the, CRIS the bacterial CRISPR immunity. Uh, we express this, this anti-Cas9 in the germline, and we see that when we have this uh, anti-Cas9 uh, in, in, uh, in a mosquito that contains the gene drive, we, we reestablish the, the inheritance of that gene drive construct to the 50% normal Mendelian. That means that we have 100% inhibition of, uh, of the CRISPR-Cas activity, and therefore CRISPR-Cas homing. Um, so that looks very promising. We start doing some modeling to see what these things can do. We see that when we release uh, uh, in enough frequency of this, uh, can stop our current gene drives that are otherwise reaching uh, high frequency and, and crash the population rapidly. We can stop them and removing, uh, remove them from populations. Um, and say so that, uh, I want to thank... Uh, all the people in the Crisanti lab, which is grew a lot over the last few years, uh, all the funders, uh, DARPA has funded uh, uh, countermeasures, uh, and Bill Gates, uh, the Gates Foundation has uh, founded uh, over the years uh, all the, the mm, genetic control uh, uh, studies. And from January also, the news for me is that I will be moving after a good number of years uh, uh, at Imperial to for a new challenge in, a, uh, in the countryside in UK, uh, in this smaller university, it's called Kiel. And thanks, uh, thanks a lot for the attention and happy to take any questions.